His two henchmen fell down on him. Not yet. In 1923, I was in the real estate business in Los Angeles, and I had a picture on my desk of an old man with a white beard down about to his navel, and the caption was, I'm an old man, and I've had many troubles. <clears throat> Most of which never happened. I like that real, real good. This is we decided yesterday to be a question period. And uh, Chuck Borden has the first question. Chuck, uh, I don't hesitate to ask you a question. Obviously, we can't transmit something we don't have. That's what you're referring to. But you don't have to... Uh, you don't have to be anything but kind to carry a message. Really, that's all. A little love. Okay. In our sobriety, how do we deal with emotions? A. Others we work with in the program... And our own sobriety. I got into that, I guess. 
As if sobriety was fourfold. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Emotional would just be one of the areas of our lives that has to become stable. For instance, if we're going to work with alcoholics, we can't afford to become emotionally involved in their program. Or in their problem, I mean. Not in their program, in their problem. We can't afford to become emotionally involved in the problem or we lose all of our <coughs> possibility for help. <clears throat> you got to stay above the problem. Now, it seems like maybe that that would be a a sort of a cold attitude. It is not. You have to love more to stay emotionally involved, uninvolved in the problem than you do to become involved in it. The answer is not in the problem. <clears throat> the answer is in the answer. I worked on my problem for 10 years. And the more I looked at the problem and the harder I worked on the problem, the greater the problem became. It was just like fertilizing and watering and cultivating the weed. It grew out of all proportions. And I think we have to be able to live above the problem to be of value to those who had it. We don't get emotionally involved in the problem. It's not that we love less, it's that we love more. I think it takes much more love to release than it does to hold on to. Emotional stability comes, I am sure, out of this thing we call self-discovery. Physical sobriety comes from not drinking. We don't drink today. And after a while, we are physically free from the effects of alcohol. But until we become emotionally stable, mentally stable, and spiritually somewhat stable, uh... We are, we're not sober. Sobriety is the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with one's self. I find much, much confusion in this area of becoming emotionally involved in uh, the problems of our so-called babies. Many people think you've got to be emotionally involved in it. <coughs> and I think we completely stymie ourselves when we do that. That's the what about sex after sobriety? Is there anybody here that wants to cover that?
as we said yesterday, love includes possession, but not the necessity to possess. I think that uh, it's perfectly possible to live very happily in a marriage relation without uh, uh, emphasis on that particular deal. I know it's quite important to many, many people. It's strange how important that it gets at times, and uh, then uh, in a little while, how unimportant it is. <laughs> <laughs> We used to call it the biggest nut there is, <laughs> you know. But I, I, I realize that this is a problem in many, many families. It might be in mine. I don't know. But I believe that sex as such should be just as spontaneous as everything else. I think it should come as the result of love. You know, the givingness of self to self in love. And I think that's the only way it has any value at all. I think that we as a sex are very, very lacking in this area. Actually, I do. All men. Because we are inclined to want what we want when we want it. And uh, it's to explode. And that's what uh, happens. And when the explosion's over, the, 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 the job's done, as far as we're concerned. But I feel that that's totally selfish approach. I think that the love and adoration, both before and after the act, is far, far superior than to the act itself. In other words, I find nothing wrong with sexual intercourse as a result of love, but as a, an objective, I think it's self-robbery again. It's a beautiful thing when it's the givingness of self to self in love, and otherwise I find no value in it. That's all I can say. What is the value of patience when counseling with another alcoholic? We had all the alcoholics in the world in this room. Right now, we would have 90% of the patients of the human race. We are a very impatient lot. We want everything to happen yesterday. And patience is certainly a virtue. <laughs> I doubt very much if uh, our value as a counselor would equal our value as a listener. If you can get the guy talking, or the gal, if you can get them talking. This is the deal. In my own case, if I'm talking to somebody new, the one thing that I listen for is the first attempt at a belly laugh. This ain't no big deal. You can't get serious. An alcoholic cannot take a preachment or a lecture. 
We know all about the preachment and the lecture. We've given them to ourselves a thousand times. We know exactly what they're going to say before the sale. And so, the cherry, and to get them to talk and be a good listener gives the counselor more value than talking himself. We're not experts on anything. <clears throat> and it's the simple little thing that opens the door. It isn't the profundity. Nobody ever got sober on profundity. Nobody. Little thing. You never heard me tell this, but I was talking at the Bob White group many years ago on Santa Barbara and Van Ness. And there was a drunk in bad shape sitting right about there where castle, this city. And uh came time for him to light a cigarette. And he couldn't he couldn't do it. He couldn't get the things to make. And he struggled and he struggled and uh after a while a little old lady that was sitting next to him reached over and took his cigarette and his match and lit it and put it in his mouth. And the next year I was there at the same time. And this guy got his birthday, first birthday. And I thought, well, I must have done pretty well, you know, in that talk. <laughs> so I was prepared to get a nice compliment, you know, when he got up to take his birthday cake. And he said the reason he was back was not what was said or done in the meeting. It was the fact that this little old lady had lady a cigarette for it. This thing don't depend on profundity. Expertise. It's love. And love is patient. Love is patient. Not everyone that I love to think about. This happened to the Hopper group. I felt there on Friday before Christmas every year. And ten or a dozen years ago, there was a guy sitting along the wall. There were benches along the wall. And he was leaping. He wasn't shaking. He was leaping. <laughs> and I went over and sat down beside him before the meeting started. And I put my arm around the guy. And I said, Sunday ain't no big deal. If you don't drink, if you don't take that next drink, three days you'll be pretty nearly well, physically. Just put it off. Don't take that next drink. It ain't no big deal. Make a game out of it. You go for three days without a drink. See what happens to you. And for years, he's gone by me. Or oh, uh, at least once a year in some meeting. And he gets right up to my left ear and he says, Son, ain't no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on about his business. So, yes. If you love him, you're patient. Next. How do we surrender and turn our will to God when after asking for guidance? We still ponder at times. There are many times when even prayer is like braying up a chimney. No way can you seem to make any conscious contact with anything. Everything's futile. You have no purchase it all up there on the end of that line. And that's what the book means when it says when everything else fails, get your wet drunk. <laughs> because, you see, when we're feeling futile, we want something. We want something. 
But it isn't happening. And there's no way that you can want something when you're working with a wet drug. No way. You can't think about yourself when you're working with a wet drug. That's one place where you give all your attention and interest and love to the thing it has. If it's just simply to outmaneuver it. <laughs> it neither be the pukey or the puke or in that case. So we got to get ourselves off, off our mind. Now I have a a thing of my own, I can't solve a problem. There's no way I can solve a problem, and I haven't tried it much in these last 29 years because I've expected guidance and direction. But if I wake up to the fact that I'm all tied in a knot, working on something, and I'm just completely rigid almost, subconsciously, I've been messing with this thing and beat my brain down. And I recognize it. And this is my little deal, and it, uh, it works for me right along. I, as I said to you, I share everything with my own God, good, bad, and indifferent. And in this case, I say, look, Dad, I'm beating my brains out over this problem, and I don't know the answer. You do. And when you get re ready to give it to me, I'd certainly be glad to have it. Sure, thank you. And I'd dump it. And i never look at it again. i just dump it. That's it. And in a very short time, I find out that it either wasn't a problem in the first place, which is about 50% of the time, or I have the answer. It's the self-concern and the impatience that bring about this sort of an impasse in our own lives and to get ourselves off our mind. There's nothing more highly recommended than to sit down with a wet drum. Does that do you any good? With Eagle and Sal taking over periodically, do I analyze and look for answers too much? You're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> if I were you, I'd just give up. I find uh, so many of our people, uh, even in the grapevine, I find so many of them writing about self-esteem. Building self-esteem. I hear people get up here and talk all the time about you have to learn to love yourself before you can love anybody else. And I am most grateful that that ain't the case. I never spent any time trying to build up self-esteem. I never spent any time trying to love me. I wouldn't have taken me with a large dowry. I hated my damn guts. And so, I got busy doing things this book suggests. And it wasn't trying to learn how to self-esteem me or to love me so I could love you. I don't, I, I don't think that that uh, is the way it is at all. Francis says, for it is better to love than to be loved. It is better to understand than to be understood. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgetting that we're forgiven. And it is in dying to self that we awaken to eternal life. And that's exactly what we've been talking about ever since we've been done. It's exactly what we've been talking about. I don't believe that an image, Phil, I don't believe that an image 
of me would add anything to my life at all. I haven't any more image of me than I have of a walrus. That isn't what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the image of me. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to share me with anybody that wants me in love and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not even interested in your opinion of what's happened, except when you want to give it to me. That's not my deal. I love you. I love you, and that's all I have to do. That's what I'm interested in. That's my deal. It's not my deal who you love or what you love or what you think. That's your deal. I love you, period. I don't even have to concern myself about what you think of me. I got no image at all of me. I think of myself exactly as that big window up there in front of my chair. That window, to me, is me. And when there's no obstruction, the light comes through. But the window is not the light. And I think of that drape as my ego. And when that drape's closed, the light don't come through. But just as the window is not the light, the drape is not the darkness. It just sh shuts out the light. So my business is keep the drape open, Phil, and let the light shine. And I don't furnish the light. I'm a channel. I'm a channel. You and I are necessary to God as channels through which he goes forth into his creation. We're channels. Then we get ourselves out of the way and let it be. And let it be. Now, as we said last night, and as I say to me all the time, I'm either going to run my life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to let run it and take the consequences thereof, and I can't run mine. And I don't get involved in running my life. I get involved in living. I think losing yourself in life guarantees finding yourself in God. Guarantees it. Because all you got to do is to get rid of the roadblock. You lose yourself in life and find yourself in God. And Phil, I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't spend another five seconds trying to find self-worth or anything else. To find yourself, yes. To realize that whatever it is you're looking for is right here. What you're looking for, you're looking with. What you came here to get came with you. Everything you ever wanted to know, you've always known, and everything you've always wanted to be, you've always been. But it's covered up. It's covered up. So we uncover and discover. And get lost in that building. Forget about you. To hell with you. And you've got a little better break on that than I have. Maybe you have, and maybe you ain't. Phil's got a little income. <laughs> so it allows him to uh, have a little more time on his hands than maybe he should have. <laughs> you know? You hear yourself? I think that's it. Forget about old Phil and just do. Do. And let the chips fall where they may. The beautiful thing about this deal is not to get serious about yourself. To make the whole deal a game. A play of life upon itself. And you have fun out of it. I have more fun with God than I do with you. I have a hell of a lot of fun with God. I think that the guy has a tremendous sense of humor. Or he wouldn't have hit himself in the last place we ever looked. You know. I think it's pretty. 
I can just see him, you know. <laughs> Here I am, I'm trying to find a bottle. Off hours, you know, and I've got to have a drink. He <laughs> look at that son of a bitch. Not me, and I'm with him. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's a fun deal. You're too serious, Phil. Yes. Make it, make a fun deal out of it. Huh? That'll help any? Should members of AA work professionally in the field of alcoholism? <laughs> Will some of you counselors answer that one? I do not really uh, care much to comment on it, but I would say this. It's awfully hard. It's awfully hard for amateurs like us to get mixed up with professionals and stay amateurs. We're strange bunch. All we have to do is to rub elbows a little while with a doctor and we become doctors. <laughs> Maybe some people can retain their amateur standing in working for money in the field of alcoholism. I don't know. Maybe they can. But in my personal life, I've met only one that seemed to do it, and he wasn't around long enough to really uh, see whether it was going to work out or not. And that was Warren Snyder. Warren died about a year or so after, two years after he started uh, working in the field of alcoholism for money. Now, the one thing that would seem to be furthest from a paid 12-step call would be working with the National Committee on Alcoholism. Because the National Committee on Alcoholism has no recovery program at all. They are educational and referral. That's their business. And that's not the business we're in. So it would appear that there would be no conflict to work for the National Committee on Alcoholism. Because they, they, they have no, no uh, program of recovery. But those of my friends who work with them somehow become professional. I'm mindful of one gal I love very, very much. And ten years ago, she made one of the finest AA talks I ever heard in my life. And she became an employee, secretary, Committee on Alcoholism, and she talked about a group a year ago, yes. And she made her just as fine a talk as she ever made. But it wasn't Alcoholics Anonymous talk. It was a professional talk. It was a professional talk. And the one thing about us that we must maintain is Caring and sharing. We're not experts on anything. We share our experience, strength, and hope. One with another in love. And so I haven't seen anybody even be able to do that kind of thing without seeming to get lost in infection professionally. Incidentally, it wasn't three months after that talk that she was in the hospital herself. Not, I'm sure, for either pill to drink, and I say I'm sure, I'm not sure of anything. I'm like, Phil, I don't know nothing. <laughs> but she was in the hospital. 
for a sort of a breakdown of some kind. I can't do it. Personally, when I talk for organizations that have an honorarium, the, the thing I do carry is an honorarium for, say, 75 to $150 dollars. I don't take it. I don't take it. Because whilst they don't know it, I'm going to play this. I learned what I'm telling them from you guys. From drunks who don't drink. And I can't any more take an honorarium than I can fly. Because you guys didn't charge me a thing. You didn't even ask me if I had anything. The only thing you said to me is, Mister, were you looking for somebody? And I said, No, sir. And you said, Well, what were you looking for? And I said, If it was interesting, sir, I was looking for sobriety. And you lit up like a Christmas tree. Took me and rocked me to sleep. Now I'm certain that any alcoholic is totally. Free to make a living. I think we're entitled to make a living. But if I were a preacher, excuse me, Dave. <laughs> if I were a preacher, I would want my business on the side. Because I would not want to get up here. And try to tell you monkeys what you want to hear. I would not want my gas and water in your hands. If you don't like me, you cut off my gas and water. So I've got to try to please you. I can't do that. I would want my business on the side. I want my money coming in from here. So I can tell you what I think. I can't talk without saying it as I feel it, as I think that it should be. And I can't work in that field. But if I were a captain in the Marines, and they wanted me to head up a program of alcoholism for the Marines, and I could set up my own staff, as certain Marines have had the privilege of doing, I might do what a captain in the Marines who asked that question did. He came to me and he said, what am I going to do? I said, get your staff to handle the related disorders. Get all these people that you have working with you to handle the hop heads the pill heads, the six maniacs, like, uh, who was that? <laughs> and you deal in Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the drunk and Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what you did. And it's worked out beautifully, and I don't see it's doing you any harm. Yes, they Should members of AA 10 meetings of al -Anon, are we missing anything? Well, I think they are, because most of them are women in al -Anon. Of course, my wife is is quite a nanny nanny nanny, and uh, I had a lot of fun with her. I got by for many years by saying to her when she got a little out of line, "Look, sister, you that'd have been for us <laughs> because we loaned to my program, you know." And after a while, she got 
smarty pants. And she starts saying we wouldn't have needed a program of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see why I should go anyplace else or have to go anyplace else to find out how to work my program in Alcoholics Anonymous. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see when you do Long before Alcoholics Anonymous, before Al Anon was born. When people were coming to me and saying, you got to get this guy sober, or this gal sober. I was saying to them, maybe, maybe, this is the best time in your life to find yourself. Maybe the only chance you've got to help this outie is not to come to me, but to apply these principles to yourself. Find your own peace. And maintain your own peace in your own household. And it might be the, the only good thing you can do for that drug. This is a long time before our mother was born. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to find living answers in our program. Which we must find along with sobriety. And I don't mind going to Alan Unmeetings. I talk before Alan Unmeetings a great deal. As a matter of fact, you people don't know it. But you're looking at the greatest Alan Unmeetings speaker there is. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, a Swede from Dallas called me. Old in Lancaster, I guess that's Swedish or something. I don't know. And it was Thursday. And Nolan says, Chuck, when you when can you leave for Dallas? I says, I'm not coming. Oh, he says, yes, you are. He says, I'm not coming to Dallas. He says, I asked you when you leave. <clears throat> and I said, I'm not coming. And he says, I, I don't want that kind of an answer. Why do you leave it? And I says, who fell down on you? What's the matter with the speaker you had? Why didn't you ask me first? <laughs> <laughs> Who ran out on you? You said, it's none of your goddamn business. <laughs> <laughs> well, to make a long story short, I flew to Dallas and talked at the Island on Luncheon. And I was a substitute for a substitute. <laughs> the first one that had agreed to talk to the Al Anon lunch luncheon was the late Liz. You know, the gal in the, that wrote the book, the late Liz. What was her name? Gert. Gert, Be Gert Bahana. Gertie and I don't get along too well anyway. But she was the gal that, uh, was supposed to talk, and she pooped out, and the next one was the Adler Rogers said John's, and she pooped out. So I'm a substitute for two broads, substitute for a substitute. And they still say down there that I gave the best island on top of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just use that in to make it uh, hard. Now, there's no, there's no reason you shouldn't go to an Al Anon meeting and talk to Next. How do you prove love? Why well, I don't think that you prove anything. I don't think we've got anything to prove. Nothing to win, and we're not going any place. I'll have to tell you again. I said this in this meeting already. But I'll spell it again because I love it myself. This certain doctor called me at midnight. <laughs> and he says, what's your definition of love? I said, it's the same as this 10 o'clock in the morning. But then he called me at midnight and asked me what the definition of love is. He says, what's your definition of love? I said, you won't like it. He says, what is it? I said, it's action. 
talk about love is like talking about humility. I feel very humble this morning, boys. <laughs> Action. If you love somebody or something, you do something for them. You just do it. And you don't make a big deal out of it. You don't make a big deal out of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend five seconds trying to prove anything that I said from this pro podium for, to anybody here. That's not why I'm here. To prove something. I wouldn't spend five seconds trying to, trying to defend anything I've said. I have, a, I have a right to my own opinion, and you have a right to yours. And you have my approval. If you want to just read everything I've said, and the way I've said it, it's perfectly all right with me. And the same thing is true with people every place. I love you. It's none of my business what you think of me, unless you want to make it so. So quit trying to make something out of it. Prove it. Next. Upon waking with negative thoughts, how does one establish a relationship with God? I think this is what we've been talking about all weekend. Praying without ceasing. I find no difference in a prayer and a serious thought. It's the same thing. As we said uh, since we've been here, Fear, worry, is a prayer for something you don't want to happen. To live in the conscious awareness of the living presence of God. I don't even like too much, I talk about it an awful lot, but the Our Father prayer. Our Father, God. I talk about our Father lots. But this relationship that we've been talking about this weekend is much, much closer than a father-son relationship. As I said, I believe, I said, I've got two sons someplace in Southern California. I don't know where he's one of them are. This is impossible. with my relationship with my own God. Because God is that which I am. God is that which I am. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't be. There would be nothing. I would be extinct but for God. Because God is life. And there's no way to be separated from God in reality. <clears throat> The only separation there is, is conscious. The feeling of conscious separation from, left field. Very real as an experience, but not reality. So, I don't think that we ought to wake up feeling any difference when we went to sleep. Or feeling that it's any different than ten minutes after we get up. Now is the deal. How is it with me right now? How is it with me right now? Now, if I had to get up and start praying right quick to feel good, I don't think I'd feel good when I get to play. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ought to feel good right before I start to play. And again, my prayers. I don't know when they start to stop. You like better launch a little than that deal. Because I like to live in the conscious awareness of the living presence. God. In a relationship with everything around me. Everything around me. So I, I I think that's the thing to to sort of get through your head. That 
Now is the time. You see, this is this is so very vital to me because tomorrow was always the day I was going to straighten up and fly right. Tomorrow I was going to do it, you know. But tomorrow I never got here. Every time I came to, it was now, and I was thirsty. <laughs> so I took a drink. Tomorrow I got here, and again, I don't think I have to be in any particular position to uh, retain this feeling of the living presence of God. I don't think that it uh, happened in a church or in the mountain or in the temple or in Jerusalem. It's in my own mouth that I might know it and do it. So that's the only answer I'd have to that. Yes. When did you really start trusting God all the way? I don't know. I don't know, because I discovered that it had happened, you see. I think it happened when this thing was burned out. The first time. I think that's when it happened, because I was in here, this was me, all the time. You know. But to be born out of conscious separation and conscious unity makes it a reality. A belief in God is good, but it is not good enough for alcoholics. We have to live in God. To live in God. That's what this whole thing is all about. To get us out of our own way. So that we can go about our father's business. That's the only business I've had for 29 years. I'm in a business. I go about my father's business. And that's my business and his business take care of. Me. And it's just as natural and normal as breathing. I expect it. Not that I'm sitting around in an expectancy and waiting for somebody to pick up the phone or to ring it. It's just my being. I know that every good and perfect gift is from his hand. Father Barney said to me, ten years ago, we were driving under the Chicago Road Freeway. I was taking him home with me. We'd been in the office. And just as we went under the freeway, he said to me, Chuck, how in the hell do you fulfill your commitments? I said, what are you talking about? He says, we've got three lives. And any one of them is enough for anybody. And you do all three of them. How do you do it? And I said, Father, you ought to know that better than I do. You're a damn jetty. You've been studying all your life. And why do you ask me that question? He says, why, how do you do it? And I said, there's no division in my life. There's no division in my life. When we practice these principles in all of our affairs, gentlemen, there is no division in life. There is nothing that is more or less important, and there is nothing that is more or less spiritual than another. Your business is just as spiritual as your AA. Your AA is just as spiritual as your church. Your home is just as spiritual as both of them. Substance is just as spiritual as, uh, ha-ha. <laughs> Joy, just a spiritual. Every good and perfect gift is from his hand. And to live in this, to be a, a, aware of this, constantly aware of it. And that's what I was telling you yesterday. To trim the sails. To trim the sails. Some ships fly east and some fly west by the self-same wind that blows. It is the set of the sail and not the gale that determines where it goes. And so, trimming the sail. Saying to myself maybe 50 times a day, 
God is my refuge and my strength. I don't know why that is that. I'm not afraid of nothing. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of God. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of tomorrow or yesterday. Why would I be saying, God is my refuge and my strength? Lift up your eyes into the hills, from whence cometh thy strength. I love the hills. I love God. And I trim the sails, reminding myself that in him I live and move and have my being. The conscious awareness of the living presence of the Almighty. Now that's what this retreat's all about. There's nothing else here, so far as I'm concerned. I'm either going to run my life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to run it and take the consequences thereof. And those are not words. That's the way I live. And I cannot live any other way. I did it 43 years. And that was 43 years too long. <laughs> that do you any good? I've always been a competitor. How do I remove competition from my life? It's strange thing to me again. But I have been a competitor all my life. I was corrected this morning because there's a man here two years older than I am. Sure don't live it, but he had a very sheltered youth. <laughs> I could do anything with my body up until I got hurt in football. I could do anything. Football, basketball, baseball, and track. The whole business was just duck soup. Old Walter Camp said years ago, the only way I could keep from being an All-American was to get hurt. So I got hurt. <laughs> got removed from football. Competition was my life. I had a brother that was three and a half years old than I. And we were competitors. From the time I could walk until I left home at 20, we were in a fight. Lasted 20 years on the installment plan. <laughs> and he was three and a half years older than I and three and a half years stronger. And up until I was 18, 19, 20, he could whip me. But he couldn't make me believe it. He could not make me believe it. We saw to fight his kids two miles from home. And every time he got off of me, I'd dog him. <laughs> and we'd end up in the living room and mother whip us both. And I left home at 20 thinking I could whip that guy. You know? He never did make me believe that he could whip me. So competition, yes, it was my life. Now I do a lot of lawn bowling. And if I go down there to beat somebody, uh, I'm like a wash woman. It's just like I never had a bowl in my hand. But if I go down there to, to, to do the best I can with what I got and enjoy my competitor's shop just the same as my own, I beat anybody in the place. 1957, I say, was champion of the Beverly Hills Lawn Bowling Club. And I only bowl twice a week. I bowl Saturday and Sunday. And all the rest of them bowl all day. And you know, uh, that's a delicate, delicate game, long bowling. So I can't compete with anybody. And again, it is not because I decided not to compete. You see, I'm lucky. I'm lucky, lucky, lucky. Because I didn't want nothing when I came here. Not even sobriety. I just wanted to rub out as much of the record as I could. And you can't rub out a record thinking, you know, in terms of competition. You can't do it. You just help people do things they need to have done because you want to. And I had to do that to rub out. And when I 
finally woke up to the fact that things were going good, I was in the habit of it. And I just kept doing it. And I'm still doing it. And I believe this is the thing that uh, we're talking about. Our civilization has laid so many things on us that are totally extraneous. You have to be this and have that and be known as before you can live. You know? And the only thing you can do with life, gentlemen, is live it. Being is the only thing that counts. The this of the now is the only thing that counts in this life. Take no thought of tomorrow. Let's just lead what you should drink. The woman already should be clothed. The Heavenly Father knows what you have need of for you. Yes. Now then, my son, it's so much more fun to get as much fun out of your opponent's shot as your own. It's so much more fun. It's twice as much. And if you're in a force, it's four times as much. You know? It's normal and natural that you wish your, uh, suppose, supposedly, uh, your so-called competition well. Wish them well. They do their thing and you do yours. And there's no competition if you're doing it right. There's no competition. There's no feeling of competition in it. Now, just while I've got it on my mind, all we've got to do, everything that this thing is about, is shift in the motivation in your life. That's all you've got to do. Shift the motivation from taking something from to giving something, to adding to. Even when you go to a, a meeting, and out on and on, Shift your motivation from going to get to going to add to. From the time I discovered I was sober, six months after I got here, until right now, I have never gone to meetings to get anything. And I can't go to a bad meeting. I can go to a meeting and disagree with everything that's done in it. The speaker and everything he says and the way he says it. And come out with a full cup. Because it always happens if you go hoping that somebody just seeing you might get a lift, you know. It might do somebody good just to see you there. And maybe somebody will ask you a question that you can answer, that you can share. And you can't come away from that thing without a full cup. And it's just shifting your attitude. From taking from to adding to. And you do it throughout your life. Everything in life. And it's not a do-gooder attitude. God damn the do- Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Morning, Dave. Not that you want to be, you know, to be a do-gooder. As you said yesterday, to be good for something is self robbery even if it's to go to heaven. To be good for something is self robbery To be good for nothing. That's the fun deal. Just to be good for nothing. How do I overcome the assistance of, the, of my family and business associates that I should make plans for tomorrow and the future? Okay. Am I supposed to quit at 11? I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. I don't think I told you guys about having to walk off from a half a million dollars in 1957. Did I tell you about that? I won't tell you this because this is the answer to your question. When I was you were sober, I ran into Fish Property, which is the corner of Guardia and Normandy. It was owned by some very good friends of mine, Jackson Brothers, the builders. 
Very good morning, so if you pardon me, Dave. Did you hear the one? I'll tell you the one about this, you know. The Pope got the College of Cardinals together. And he said, boys, I just got a phone call, and I got some good news and the bad news. He says, well, which do you want first? And they figure it out, and they said, we'd like the good news first. And he said, well, the phone call said that the second coming of Christ had already taken place. Christ is at this time. Walking the earth. And they thought that was great. He says, now what's the bad news? He says, the telephone call came from Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> so, I knew this property was 10 acres on the corner down there, and I knew it was a tremendous buy, and I thought it was a good place for a market. In my early years in the market business, I got all of my business from promotions. I found who owned properties and talked to them about either leasing them or building a building or whatnot, you know. And if they wanted to do something, I'd get a tenant for it. And all that stuff, or I'd buy the property for them. And all that was just to get a fixed order. I wasn't in the real estate business at that time at all. I was in the fixture business. Now, I knew values, and I was pretty well familiar with what would make a good market site and what wouldn't. And I liked this property, and I thought, who would I get to buy it? And it occurred to me that my boss might want it. Because his father had started the business, and he was a wealthy man before he took it over. 1908, his dad had started this thing. And he was very wealthy. And so, I went in one morning, and I said, Victor, I found something you might want. And he said, what is it? And I told him about it. And he listened, and he says, go buy it, Charlie. And I said, no. I says, I'll sort to you, but I will go buy it. No, he says, you like it, go buy it. I said, no, Victor. Get in the car and we'll go down. We can go down and back in an hour. And so we did. And he looked at it, and he said, go buy it. I said, no. Let's find out if anybody else in town likes it. Let me bring a couple of market operators down here and see if they like it. He said, I'd like to have a building on it. He says, Charlie, you like it. Go buy it. And I went and bought it. And when I got to Westco, one night after everybody had gone but his secretary and myself, he called me in. The two of us were with him. And he says, Charlie, I didn't want that property. I don't want it. I don't need it. I want to get you in the same position I'm in. And as soon as I get you in the same position I'm in, We'll retire together. Now, I'm giving you 25% of this deal. 25% of this deal is yours. Now, go out and get us a tenant, and we'll build him a building, and we'll go from there. 25% of this deal is yours. And I went, and I got bonds to take a deal on it. They didn't like it. But, said they... This is the first time we've ever had any, uh, any uh, chance to do anything for Charlie. <laughs> and he's not going to us a bum still yet on location. So, let's take it. It can't be that bad. It can't hurt us much. So they took the deal because of me. And they knew about my 25%, not only from me, but from Victor. <clears throat> and so, we built them a building. Jackson Brothers built it. And he built it for half a fee. Five percent and said ten. Because I'd known them since they were <coughs> labor contractors. The two boys and their father and their uncle. Contracted labor for duplexes over there between Highland and La Brea and north of Third Street and Hancock Park. And I was a duplex king. We worked together a lot. And we knew each other good. And so they wanted to do something for me, too. They built a building for half fee. We needed a loan. I went to Vernon Jenkins, who was chairman of the board of uh, 
after him in life. And Ed called on his son. And he, he's getting sober. And Burns after the sun rose and set in me. And I went down to him. I said, Burns, we need a loan to build a building. He says, what do you want? He says, you got any way you got down here, including the company. Just tell me what you want and you've got. And so, everybody in the deal knew all about it. And we built a building and Barnes opened it and it was a bonanza. From the very beginning, it was a bonanza. We were getting from 17 to $2,100 a week rent. A week, gentlemen, rent. Because we had a percentage lease. Had it out, it was just so good. Hundred, hundred and twenty-five, hundred and forty thousand a week. They were doing volume in that place. On a percentage lease. And everybody was very happy. And then I got no ass department stores. And we built them a department store, and they went the same way, and everything was good. To make a long story short. Ten years later, in my eleventh year, Victor was going to retire, and I was going to retire with him. Now, all this time, we had talked about this thing. We talked about what I was doing. We had laughed and cried together because we're just as one man. Up until the last year. And my 11th year, it seemed like the guy was growing away from me, but I just thought it was because he was retired. And he was, you know, it was, his mind was on something else. But I was a retired man. We talked about it for 10 years. And when it's any time to do it, well, incidentally, first, the next thing is I bought that house where I live now because I was going to retire. Because my part of this year, this deal was worth 500000 bucks for this time. A minimum of 500000 And that was my security, you see. So I was going to retire. Now, I had very, very good, uh, commendable motivation. I was going to retire and spend my whole time working with bums like you at my own expense. There's nothing wrong with that motivation, huh? So I bought that house to retire. And it came right down to the wire, and they couldn't do it. He could not do it. It was too much money. And he had to deny the whole thing. And uh, it was impossible. Because we had been just like that. We had laughed and cried for ten years. And we discussed this thing time and time again. We were going to retire again. And he couldn't do it. It was too much dough. And they had to do, not deny the whole that blame thing. Now, I, I was naturally uh, destroyed because I could not believe that this man would do that. I couldn't believe that he could possibly do it. And my insight says, you can't let him do this for his own benefit. You can't let him do this to himself. And my trembling was in my hair and where I was right. And my inside says, this is for your family, your kids and your wife. This is their thing. You know. And uh, it's just can't be, you know. And I talked to counsel, bird counsel, legal counsel. And they said to me, Charlie, you can take him to court and beat your hands down. You've got every witness in town. Everybody in town knows about that thing. From him and from you. <coughs> so you can take him to court and beat him. Like that. Then I consider taking him to court. But I couldn't take him to court. Why? Because in 1946, he came in to throw me through that window, but he didn't. He didn't throw me through that window. And I couldn't take him to court. 
and I couldn't judge him. I couldn't resent him. I couldn't hate him. Because if I did, I'd get drunk, and if I got drunk, I'd die. And here I am between a rock and a hard place, suffering the tortures of the damned. Because I couldn't see through this damn thing, you know. It was just a reversal of everything that we built on for ten years. Now it was interesting because his secretary had heard this thing too. And I would talk to her about it. And she heard things that she wanted to hear. But when she didn't want to hear anything, uh, even if she heard it, she didn't hear it. Because she had a hearing problem. And she would tell me, uh, Charlie, I, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't hear it right. Well, now the reason she said that was because this guy's dad had set up a $30,000 this thing for her, and Victor had him paid it. And she had $30,000 coming. And she couldn't fix that, <laughs> just for that. <laughs> so she had to tell me I you know. And I did the whole thing. It was very, you can see what a thing it was. Because I had subconsciously come to believe this was my spirit. And it took me a whole year of the most excruciating pain. The only thing that was good about that pain period, except what came out of it, was that there wasn't one instance in the whole year that it ever occurred to me to take away. Now that's, that's something. Because I suffered the tortures of the day. But, long towards the end of the year, I came to see that there's only one security. This is the answer to your question. There's only one security. That's my own relationship with my own God. There are no values out there. The values are here. There's evidence of value out there, but no value. The minute we put a value on a million bucks, we were tied in noose around her neck. Because we allowed her to lose it. Just as that 500 grand, you know. So there's evidence of value out there, but the value is right here. Remember, the man said, there's the last time I'm going to say this in this meeting. Excuse me, Paul. Where are you? <laughs> you got that. He had to run out because he's heard this story 14 times. <clears throat> the man said, lay up for yourselves treasures. No, he says, uh, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Where the rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For rust does not corrupt, and thieves don't break through and steal. Because where the treasure is, there will be the heart also. So I had to come to see that there's only one security, and that's my own relationship with my own God. And when that happened, I called back in one night. Everybody was gone again. It took an eye. And I said, Victor, I want to go through this deal with you once more. And I don't want you to let me make one mistake. If I say anything that isn't exactly as it happened, stop me. And we learned that out of stop talking. And I went through the deal step by step. And when I got through, I said, Victor, you didn't stop me. And he said, no, Charlie, I didn't. And I said, is that exactly the way it happened? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, Victor, you take it. You need it. I don't need it. God bless you. 